fiction. Science fiction. Horror. Fantasy. Crime. LGBT. Thriller. You have now entered the House of Mystery. With your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino, John Copenhaver, and Al Warren. One hundred two point three FM Riverside and one hundred five zero AM Palm Springs. Welcome back into the House of Mystery, and of course, I'm Al Warren and Mr. David Martino. I'm not. You are not. I'm not. Or do you want to be? Everybody wants you. Isn't that what <laughs> Billy Billy Squire said? Billy, isn't that his name? Billy Squire. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, Billy Squire, oh. yeah. And that's who we got. We got the third guy on board is Mr. Jack Wells, who was really Billy Squire after his failed career in music. It was the music <laughs> video that did me in. If you watch the music video, you'll understand completely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I, I to tell you the truth, that didn't bother me. That video, no, no, because it sure seemed like it pissed <laughs> everybody else off, like everybody else. It wasn't his image. It just wasn't, you know, he was like the, you know, everybody wants you type thing guy, and he did the stroke and all that, and then also he's dressed up in those little outfits, and they're all kind of dancing around. It didn't, it didn't fit the, it didn't fit the rock. No, you know, no. You know, he's no. opening for, like, the scorpions, and it just sort of, well, that doesn't work. You yeah, know, that guy is him. not a rock god. Nope, not him. No, yep. no. So that kind of so that that's why it just sort of. But this, this I think the music was fine. The oh, songs no, no. were fine. And songs the, are great. I guess I know people take it too serious, you know. But it doesn't that's matter. that's kind of the way of the world anymore. Yeah. Well, well. So what are you doing now that you can't sing anymore? Oh, I'm writing books. You know, like every failed musician ever has. So, <laughs> well, you know, but okay. So now I don't get this. So now um, you've got a new book that is on pre-sale, and it's book three, a fatal flood, uh, monochrom noir. You know, book three and stuff like this, and it's out um, November first of this year. Yes. But then you've also got number four too. Yeah. So we uh, had a little issue with the cover for part three. So part two came out, I think, in. February or March of this year, we're talking, you know, and we're almost done with 2022 now. I never wanted this big of a gap between two and three. You know, as a, as a serialized um, series, you don't want to go too long because then you're going to alienate your audience as they forget what happened in part two. They move on to other books, other series, and you're kind of left in the dust. Um, so it was never supposed to take this long. Uh, unfortunately, the cover took a little longer than necessary or longer than expected, we'll say. And now that we're here and I have both covers, the publisher and I were like, you know what? Let's just press and get this out to everybody who's been patiently waiting. So that way they only have to wait a month for part four. And I'm I'm all in. I think that's great. Yeah, because that's November 1st, December 1st is part four. So yep. um, I actually, you know, the, the part four book is cover is better than three. Do you really think so? Yeah. Well, thank you. I I don't know. Three is is definitely the one that appeals to me because she's just got that Marilyn Monroe like look to her. I, I don't know, but I do love four. It's a toss up, honestly. It's really hard to choose. You know, the, the top. No, covers. I would pick four as the best of all four. Just with Henry being prominent. Yeah, because it's sort of um, it covers more. You have more thought going on. Three looks like an angry woman. <laughs> like you score, and I'm I'm gonna fix you good. Oh yeah, well, that's what I get that feeling of. It's yeah. more of a, and four is is a lot more complex. Four definitely has much more going on, and and talking. It's kind of fun when you talk to the uh, the artist, you know, where he's read the story, but as far as the images go, he's just taking the the rawest of emotions and translating that into his art. So he kind of gave me the rundown and his inspiration for four and just listening to him talk about it was amazing because he really captured all the feeling that he wanted to convey in just that image. It's incredible when you start, he points out the red, he points out Charlie and shadow and all these things. And it's like, here's my reasoning why. And I was like, damn, like you really did nail it. You have to be the down on his luck private investigator, right? Cause you love whiskey. Oh, absolutely. 
And one of my beta readers was like, hey, I'm reading this, and I swear this is just you. You know, and I'm like, uh, it's not me, but there's definitely a lot of facets of me in that character. I can't lie. Well, you know, it's funny. Speaking of whiskey, you know, uh, I have to thank you again for the uh, Writer's Tear wi- Tears Whiskey Flask. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. Yeah. You were the guy. Which you I'm drinking out of right now. Him, no. and I have the show. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't I worry, mean. Al. You've got presents. <laughs> yeah, no worries there. No, I, it's funny because, you know, it's so I live in Utah, right, which is, I, it's not a dry state, but they definitely try. And I'm in the liquor store, and I see this writer's tears, you know, and, of course, I'm knee-deep in the middle of trying to self-publish this book and find a publisher and doing all this stuff, and I'm like, damn, that, I got to buy that just on general principle, like, you know, and lo and behold, it's actually a fantastic whiskey, and lo and behold, it came with these cool flasks. So it's just kind of, the timing was really kind of amusing. <laughs> well, how, how, how is it working, you know, with the uh, with an artist and uh, uh, kind of having them translate? It's an interesting process, especially when you consider that my artist is over in England, right? So you already have this time zone difference. Um, and he's also in several bands, like, and quite successful at it. And so not only is he doing music and he's doing art, but he's, his, he's even been contacted by like some high profile comic book companies and stuff to do promos and artwork for. So the, the, the guy is, is seriously in demand. And all of that happened about right after I commissioned him and asked him to do some artwork. So I, he, he's, I'm like this small fish in this very, very big pond as far as he's concerned. But I think, I think he treats me well because he, he did read the stories. He does love the stories. And that was his first ever book commission for art. So that's kind of special. So it's, wow. it's a process and it's an interesting process, but he's, he is fantastic. I mean, just the, just the top notch oh, yeah, guy. Absolutely. So he's stuck with you. He is stuck with me, unfortunately. <laughs> like I, I told him, I said, you have now defined the very look of this series. There can't be anybody else. It, it, it just can't happen. Do you, do you like, um, when you're writing about this, uh, private investigator and all this stuff going on, this, this, do you, do you, um, have a problem writing, uh, evil characters or bad people in, in the books? No, actually, it's kind of fun, you know, because you know, we're all supposed to be, we're all taught to be good and share and do all these things, but we all, we all have those inner demons that kind of sometimes we're petty, sometimes we're mean, sometimes we're, you know, heartless. I don't know. It's, they're all there, right? And so it's very interesting, I think, to get to explore that other side and really think, and, and I don't want to ever do it for shock value. I want it to make sense in the context of the story why they're doing the evil things that they're doing. And uh, it's fun to really explore, okay, why would he do this? Okay, and then what would he do next? And then what's the fallout from that? So, no, I enjoy it. So well, you're, you're in touch with the uh, evil characters, um do you get it in your head? Do you do you sort of live it out? Do you actually feel it, or how how do you get in touch with that person to make it so it's real? Very much so. It's it's just kind of this thought process where you're like, okay, and I don't know. I'm not going to say it's like profiling or criminal profiling, but they a lot of them say they kind of get in the head of the person they're chasing, and I, I can kind of liken it to that where I got to get in that headspace. And one of the things, and I, and I can't speak for other authors, but one of the things with writing this book is this book was exhausting because you're in these other characters' headspaces and you're basically living vicariously through them, and it's mentally draining to to be, especially in his head where he's doing these heinous, evil things, um, and I have to write it in a way that he's in. He's not just doing it; he's kind of enjoying it, and it's yeah, it, it, it's a, it kind of takes it out of you a little bit. Now, I can't remember from last time, but did you hear your characters? Do you hear them in your head? Do you, oh, yeah. Um, is that how, or is it more visual? No, oh, I you, definitely you hear, hear them. them. Yeah, oh, yeah, I hear them. And, you know, and it's some of the characters will have conversations in your head, and you're just basically sitting back as a third party taking notes, trying to get it all down. You know, it's you're transcribing as these two characters mm-hmm. are going at it. It's, yeah, yeah, they're all in there. That's the same for me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad it's not just me. I hear voices. <laughs> yeah. So, you um, you wake up in the middle of the night and find bodies and stuff like that around your house, or <laughs> not there yet? But you know, the, the the day's still young. We won't tell anyone. That's yeah. right. We don't talk yeah. about that. No. no. Well, that's crazy. Is it the character, or is it the uh, thing that happens, like the setting, that uh, leads the story? This particular series is very character driven. Um, 
I've read a lot of stories where it's very plot driven and you've got these kind of thinly drawn characters that you're supposed to follow and root for. And I find it difficult to root for characters that aren't very well developed because you're, you're kind of held at an arm's length from them. So how can you possibly develop any kind of feeling or emotion for characters that you know nothing about? And for me, the characters help drive the plot. The plot exists because of some of the characters and what's happened with them and what they've chosen to do or not do. So, yeah, it's, it's a character piece first, and then the setting, with, I'd say, is a close second. How do you develop your characters? Is it something that's more intuitive? I find that it's, I, sometimes characters for me just kind of just happen. I was going to say pop up, but, yeah. But, no, <laughs> not with me in the room. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's, that's why I paused. But, um, but you know, I, I sometimes find it intuitive, or, you know, or are you taking it from, uh, I don't want to copy Al by saying people you meet and stuff, but I'm just curious, uh, you know, whether it's, it's a lot of research or it's a lot of um, uh, more I- intuitive in, in, how you, in how you develop. So one of my... One of my beta readers, and I, and I love her for this, because she messaged me the other day and said, hey, I just finished part four. She's reading way in advance and said, I think, based on these couple of lines, I think I see what you're doing here. I think I see some subtext here about who these characters are stand-ins for and homages to. And, and she went to the next layer and, and nailed it. And so it's a lot of it, I think, is, is intuitive. You know, it's, it's the, the story needs X, and then X just kind of materializes. And then, you know, then, of course, it's a question of fine-tuning that character and making sure that they have a distinct personality separate from everybody else's personality. I don't want characters that sound the same, think the same, talk the same, because people don't do that, you know, and I want them to have, yeah, it's a book set in a black-and-white world where everything's grayscale, but I don't. I still want that sense of realism, you know, where you're like, yeah, I know somebody like that, all right? That's that's the same kind of mindset I would have had in that situation. You, you have to be able to connect with your audience that way, I think. Well, what do you want them to take away from a book? Like, what do you want them to get out of this story, these these uh, four books? Uh, well, first and foremost, to be entertained. I'm not looking to do, like, any social commentary with this particular series. I just wanted a very entertaining tale, but I also want them to – to really enjoy this as a unique take on a genre that I think anymore is kind of underrepresented, you know, or if it is represented, we, a lot of people harken back to just the same old time periods that we're used to noir being coming, you know, being from. And I think it's important to break from that a little bit and say, okay, yeah, this guy's not Stephen King, but hey, this was a unique take on something that I thought I I thought was a tired genre, you know. So yeah, I want them to be entertained, and I want them to be just really kind of in love with the setting and the characters. I think the, the characters make the story, and they're the, they're the best part of it. I think so. I want them to really enjoy the characters and think about those characters even after they they close the book. What is it exactly about uh, noir that you want it to change, or what is it that you're you're sort of saying there? What do you mean? Like what's 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 this got that that hasn't? Well, it's obviously in a more modern setting. So when we think noir, we're looking for, you know, looking back to the 50s, 40s, even 60s and 70s. I mean, even like, you know, Chinatown, any of these old movies, even though they might be made in a modern time, they tend to take place in just a set few decades. And I think we're missing out on like the 80s, especially is is really a prime decade for, for noir. There's, you know, there's so much you can explore there with Cold War and, and, um, just the music and the feel of it all. Yeah, I mean, you know, people think of the '80s and they think it's all spandex and flock of seagulls, and it's like, no, that's that's just one little aspect of the '80s. There were some plenty of dark times in the '80s, plenty of dark events in the '80s. That people kind of tend to gloss over. Um, I also wanted to make it a little more. I'm not, I'm not gonna, I don't want to say feminist, but at the same time, I wanted women to have a more prominent role, other than just the object of desire, and other than just the femme fatale, because. Let's face it, a lot of the old noir, that was their role. And I think, you know, especially in modern times, that's unacceptable. We need to be a little more accepting and open. And you know, I try to have people of color, um, as I explore this, this series further, I want to be inclusive for sexuality and in religion and all these things that, you know, I think we, we need as a, as a society, to be, society to be very cognizant of and compassionate about. I want those in there. And noir in general was very, very, I want to say black and white, but it was very kind of, white centric and it you know so it was kind of a little narrow-minded if you will and it's like yeah there's no place for that anymore i wanted to broaden those those horizons a bit how many are you going to do like because this is always interesting to me when someone has a series like this and so this is book three and four coming out so is this the end of it or do you know 
So I, when I thought this story up like almost four years ago now, I had a definitive ending in mind. But at the same time, the story was just Henry. It was just Colorist Davies, and it was just the killer. That was it. And then during the writing, Charlie, the other main character, kind of wormed her way into the story. And so now, with four, it's the end of this arc, but it will continue later on down the road where it's going to be more Charlie-centric, where she kind of takes center stage, and I have a couple more books planned for her. It's like a spinoff. Yes, exactly. Yes, it is. It's the Jeffersons. It's a yep. spinoff. Yep. <laughs> Oh, only old people know that. No, no, I, I watched that show religiously. I remember. So did you have already all four books in mind and know what you were going to do with these, this story, or was this something that comes to you in the middle of the night? Uh, at a macro level, I had the basics. I had the setting, right? I had the black and white world. I knew it was going to take place in the 80s. I knew who the villain was. I knew who the hero was, and I knew how it ended. But outside of that, this was only ever initially envisioned as a short story or a novella. But as I started writing it and developing these characters and adding these other plot points, I realized there was no way that the story was going to be, I guess, efficiently or satisfactorily um, wrapped up in a novella you know, length. There's no way. So then it kept it kept broadening and broadening, and it got. Um, I mean, I'm like almost at I think 260,000 words or something is how this is how big this thing's going to be at the end of it, which is two thirds of The Stand by Stephen King, which is ridiculous. <laughs> You know. <laughs> Talking about a black and white world, monochrome. What what techniques do you use to to get that across to the reader that they're they're in this different world that they they see things in black and white and with these with these um, just like I guess little glimpses of of color. It's uh, it's funny because I've got we're, so we're also doing this monoverse collection where we're inviting other authors to submit short stories that are either in my same universe or kind of inspired by it and to, to, to write black and white stories, if you will. And it, it's one of those things that we talk about all the time, how difficult it is as a writer to go into something and knowingly have to remove one of the main descriptors that you're going to use in any book, which is color. Mm. So it's it's a kind of a process. It's a challenge. You have to find every possible way to say black, white, and gray Um there's, there's only so many adjectives, there's only so many synonyms that you can use, and so you have to use those in, in creative ways. Um, and every now and again, just just not often, but every once in a while, you have to re reiterate that this is a monochromatic world. I mean, people get it, and they know that when they read the synopsis, but you, when you start reading through the books, at some point, you kind of forget. Like, you're, it, you go back to your traditional mindset of, hey, this is color. It's like, no, 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 we're still in a black and white world. So you have mm -hmm. to kind of inject that every now and again into the story. But a lot of it is you just have to be really descriptive without being excessively descriptive. Everything, if you can't use color, you have to be able to describe it in other ways that is interesting to the reader. So what's what's the hardest thing about writing this book, series? Uh, the time, the devoting the time to it. Um, I think we talked last time that it's where I, or I, I have mentioned it before where we I do guerrilla writing. It's like guerrilla warfare, but it's guerrilla writing where I don't have – I work a day job. I mean, I'm working 50, 55 hours a week. I've got kids. I've got kid activities and, you know, all these things. So I write wherever I can, whenever I can. Um, so honestly, finding the time to just devote to it has been the most – probably the, the most difficult part. Yeah. Do you, do you, is there a particular um, character or person in the book that you found it to be most difficult to write? Yes, uh, Charlie. Um, she's 19, and I've never been an, a teenage girl. So I was <laughs> trying to get in that mindset of not only a teenage girl, but also a teenage girl back in 1986, you know, where I was like 10 years old. And I fondly remember the 80s, but I was not a teenager in the 80s. So it's it's really difficult, I think, to really nail that character in a, in a convincing way so she doesn't seem like just a man with female characteristics. That's you know, this I'm trying to draw write her as a woman you know so it's that that was a challenge so what did you do did you dress up like a woman and <laughs> and kind of go around and like do that whole thing or i what? can neither confirm nor deny no it's <laughs> 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 no but you watch movies and it's, it's you know you never want to take movies as fact but at the same time they do mimic reality so you watch movies you read books 
And then, honestly, I've got some great female beta readers where I'm like, hey, let me bounce this idea off you. I think it's X. And they're like, no, that doesn't make any sense. It would be Y. And I'm like, oh, great. Well, thank you. I wouldn't have known that as a, as a man. I wouldn't have known that. So I, I ask, you know. Yeah. Yeah. You have to be careful, you know. You know. Well, I don't ever want to insult anybody or anything or come across as demeaning. You know, I want these characters to be believable. You know, I don't want them to resonate with somebody. So where do you where do you see yourself going now after this? Ooh, I mean, you're, you're going to do the spinoff in that, but what are you going to go in a different direction, or are you going to get uh, uh, continue on in kind of this noir sort of setting? No, it's a good question because to be honest with you, I don't read a lot of mystery. I mean, I I don't. That's, I don't dislike it, and I love the old noir movies and some of the old noir books, but they're not my main go-to. I'm more of a science fiction, fantasy, kind of horror kind of guy. So the fact that my first ever real novel was a, a noir mystery thriller was kind of strange to me. Um, so I do want to at some point go more towards my, my, my favorite genres. I am writing a couple of scary or spooky, if you will, short stories, um, I'm in a collection that just came out from Last Waltz, which is all gothic tales, which was fun. So it's I wrote those very much in the vein of, uh, or my contributions very much in the vein of uh, Dickens and like Edgar Allan Poe, you know, with that same kind of prose and, and stuff. So I, I, I don't want to be pigeonholed into just this, you know, thriller mystery genre. I do want to explore some other stuff. But I do have some science fiction ideas. I don't know if I'll ever get to them, or at least not anytime soon, but I do want to get there at some point, you know, because I, I think it's good to branch out. It's a challenge, too. Would you ever move these characters into the 90s? Yes. So, good question, Dave, because actually I'm, not, I'm thinking about it, right? I'm like, okay, at some point in time when I go to Charlie's spinoff, do I want to have her, like, do I want to pick up the next day right after part four ends? And I don't think I do. I think I want to push it down the road a little where she's a little established and she's older and she, maybe she's a little more hardened and stuff. And so, to be honest with you, I have really been toying around with the early, early 90s. So, how do you kind of... Um classify this this writing because it's almost mystery detective noir but it's also um science fiction in a way there, yeah and there is right so there's a little bit of science fiction elements to it there's a little bit of fantasy or supernatural elements to it uh, but I, I think one of the beta readers called it magical realism and i really like that term because if you say science fiction, if you say fantasy, then people automatically have an idea in their head of what that means. And they're like, oh, spaceships and, you know, unicorns and dragons. No, 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 not none of that stuff. You know, is there a little element of time travel? Yes, there is. And that's the science fiction element. Is there a little bit of the supernatural angle with Charlie and the blood and some of the other abilities? People have? Yeah, that's more the fantasy that I'm, that I'm doing. So it's, it, I'm not going to lie, this book's kind of hard to market because it's not a straight-up mystery. So if I had to say anything, I'd say it's a supernatural thriller. With some, you know, I don't know. It's hard to market. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> yeah, because that, that is kind of unusual. But I think a lot of books are becoming more that way. They're becoming more um, – they have a lot of different genres inside of them. They do. And I think that's what today's audience wants, right, wrong, or indifferent. I think we're we're kind of geared towards that as a society to want more than just this one thing we want variety and we want it all right now so you know in that regard i guess i'm catering to to that mindset but i don't know to me this story just needed those elements to really be unique and so that's why i threw them in there i wasn't trying to appeal to a mass audience necessarily i just thought that this particular tale needed these elements to stand out so now um are you doing uh, social media? Do you like people to uh, contact you that way, or what's what's going on with with Jack Well? Yes, uh, I don't still don't have a website, so nothing's changed on that front since we last spoke. Um, I swear I'll get time one of these days to do that. So Facebook, Instagram, um, I'm actually going to be signing up here. Well, I had signed up for. I'm going to be co-hosting a podcast in January where we talk about like uh, horror movies that are not necessarily great, but they're guilty pleasures. So I'll be. I'll be doing that, too, and that will all be all over my socials as well. So, uh, yeah, Instagram, Facebook would be a fantastic way to get a hold of me. And if anybody wants to, please do. I'd love to answer any questions. Well, fantastic. And, uh, well, we'll put that up what we can on the website. We'll put your books up with their links and stuff like that. And uh, and I guess your grinder account, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I had to cancel Tinder. It was getting a little hot. So. Yeah, yeah, too busy. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, anyway, we're talking about Monochrome Noir, and we're talking about book three, oh, The Fatal Flood, which comes out November 1st, and book four, 
um, A Drowning Man, which comes out December 1st. And Mr. Jack Wells is the writer and our guest. Thank you for being here. Hey, thanks for having me. Thanks, Jack. You've been listening to the House of Mystery radio show. To find out more about our guests, hosts, or shows, go to www.houseofmystery.com. Show's over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This is the production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.